Well, it's so good to see you again uh, after being here last year, and you, one never knows if they're going to be invited back, and uh, I get danger, more dangerous every year, so uh, you have to watch out uh, for what's coming. Well, uh, we are going to be talking about the theology of the cross, and in particular, I want to spend the time uh, talking uh, with you about the Heidelberg Disputation so that you can see what's being done there and then uh, draw out a little more fully what happened uh, 500 years ago, uh, just last week uh, at the trial in Augsburg. So let's just start with the matter of the theology of the cross. Uh, it can be said simply, but after that it starts to get complicated. The uh, simple matter of the cross uh, is the way Paul puts this in Romans chapter four. Jesus Christ was crucified for your trespasses and raised for your justification, for your righteousness. And this particular matter, of course, is easy to stay, say, but all sorts of troubles start to come after this. I was, uh, I was on vicarage uh, too many years ago to even uh, remember, I suppose, uh, in the Bronx when Edgardo Gomez came up to me and said, you can't preach. So I'm going to teach you how to do this. Uh, and he took me uh, down the uh, way to a uh, Spanish-speaking Pentecostal uh, arena uh, where there were thousands uh, gathered for a church service. And I came down in my collar, tried to sit in back, and tried to be nondescript uh, and uh, as quiet as I could. And the deacons who were sitting up uh, on the stage up above in large chairs began to speak to one another. And pretty soon, one of their representatives came down all the way to the back, because I was wearing my pastoral collar, and uh, said, the Holy Spirit has told us that you are to preach today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I informed him, I can't, I'm a Lutheran, and I have to prepare my sermons. Uh, <laughs> he looked at me uh, perplexed and walked all the way back up to the stage. Then the deacons began to talk back and forth. They looked very uh, perplexed about the whole situation. Down he came again a uh, second time, and he said, no, the Holy Spirit has said, you are to preach. So I got up on uh, stage, and the only thing I could think of was uh, the, these words from, uh, from Paul. And so I gave them this particular sermon. Yeah, uh, Jesus Christ has been crucified for your trespasses and raised for your justification. Then suddenly, uh, people began to fall and drop all over this large <laughs> theater slain in the, in the, in the Holy Spirit, uh, and nurses came out with white caps holding everybody up. Uh, the Word actually does what it says. Uh, who knew? Well, I took this back and actually decided if it worked there, I was going to use it in my uh, sermon at the Lutheran Church. And so I preached that. Nobody said a single thing. I met them, uh, I met them at the back door. Uh, one fellow shook my hand and said, I like that short sermon. Well, uh, this particular matter of how it is that we're, we're conveying and preaching the cross of Jesus Christ is the crucial matter, and this is what was on Luther's mind in 1580. Remember now, we're talking about a year after 1517 legacy, and so now we have to add a hyphen for every year that comes after. And 1517, of course, is the 95 Theses and the uh, beginning of the Reformation. There's no doubt about that. But 1518 was much more important for Luther and much more important consequently for us. Now, I don't spend a lot of time uh, in the scholarship of the difference between the early and the late Luther. I'm not even particularly interested in precisely identifying the moment of Luther's breakthrough, though that itself has some interesting matters. But I will tell you that in 1518, three very important events uh, occurred for Luther, and I'm going to see if I have time today to address a little something from all three of these so that you can understand what this man was going through and what actually produced now uh, what we call this theology of the cross. The first one is the Heidelberg Disputation, which took place in the spring of 1518. So we're talking about six months or so after the 95 Theses. But meanwhile, while Luther is also uh, preparing for the Heidelberg Disputation and finally delivers this, he also is writing uh, what he calls his resolutions, 
which are his reply to the demand that he recant the uh, theses, at least some of them, in the 95 theses. And instead of, uh, uh, of uh, writing any kind of uh, recant, Luther turned it around and said, I am now resolved to hold to these particular truths. And he began writing his resolutions at the time. And uh, by the time he finished these, and by the time the year 1518 ended, Luther was at his first trial, uh, being identified as a heretic in the church and put on trial now before the greatest theologian of the day and one of the important, uh, most important representatives of the Vatican, Cardinal Cayetan, or as we say in America, Cajetan, all right? So uh, here, Cajetan is actually going to put Luther on trial, and in the trial we have what really is the moment when Luther filled in what was missing in the Heidelberg Disputation. So I want to start you out with the Heidelberg Disputation and then say we need to get to the end of the year to identify how it is that he filled in the missing component there. Because Luther's Heidelberg Disputation was itself, all by itself, one of the most dramatic moments in theological history and for that matter in his, uh, of any sort of history. This is the place where Luther starts speaking about the negative, the power of the negative, the greatness of negation. And Luther did negation better than anyone else did negation. I love the negative. Many of you are here because you love the negative. But nobody did it better than Luther. And he understood this matter of the power of the negative, so he unleashed it in the Heidelberg Disputation. You're going to start hearing a few of these things in a moment. And when Luther unleashed it, it is nowhere near what otherwise in history have, been, uh, have come to be known as the nattering nabobs of negativity. And we have all sort of these nattering nabobs of negativity who have captured the minds of people over a period of time. The chief of them, I suppose, and the first is Hegel, uh, who tried to identify what it mean meant to negate the negative. Well, it takes a German to do this. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he was... He was nowhere near as far as Luther got. Some of you will remember uh, Nietzsche here, and, all, and we have many, especially young men who are extremely attracted to this particular teaching from uh, Nietzsche and the Nihil, and how it is that you invert the law. But Luther know, knew very early on, if you invert the law, if you turn it upside down, what have you got? Well, an upside down law. Uh, you actually have more law. And Luther is going to go much further uh, at this point than someone like Nietzsche every did, ever did. Some of you have gone to college and you've learned that you live in a postmodern age. Well, of course, you've never understood what this meant. Uh, but I'm going to give it to you now in a very small little pill. This comes especially in the uh, chief uh, representative of uh, the postmodern, uh, as it's called, Jacques Derrida, who said everything, everything must in life must be deconstructed except the law. And of course, Luther is going to go far beyond this. You know the other uh, of, uh, great uh, rulers of negativity. You know, uh, you know the story of Freud. You understand uh, what it means for him to discover that all of you have an id, big deal. Uh, this is not nearly uh, the uh, situation that Luther is going to talk about and what actually needs to be negated in any person and what will be negated. And of course, Karl Marx, the one who is celebrated most at this particular point, actually thought the workers would win. <laughs> Well, uh, we've learned a little something different about this. And all of these nattering nabobs of negativity are running out there, in fact, telling you how it is that they're going to negate and, uh, the, and what it means now to live on the dark side and so on and so forth. They have no idea how it is that Luther actually lays this out. There was a 30-year study of more than 10,000 Germans which found at the end uh, that those who are bitter and pessimistic live longer. <laughs> this, 
It, of course, it was only three months longer, and uh, it was not a very uh, enjoyable three months, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, they, disco this is, they discovered it. This is what we mean by negativity. And Luther himself is going to unpack this and unleash what this power actually is. And he discovered and created, really, a uh, method for producing this that he himself called paradox. This did not come from Kierkegaard. This did not come from Haman. This came from Luther, and it came from the Heidelberg Disputations, and so he says, I'm now going to teach you by paradox. Believe me, I've been teaching for a long time, and the best way to teach is not the way that we're taught over and over again now, that you always have to synthesize and unite everything. And uh, you have to, uh, of course, uh, make sure uh, that a person is not considered to be binary. Binary is very bad. Uh, and uh, most of my students that are now presenting themselves as non-binary binary to me. Uh, but Luther now understood that the way you actually taught was presenting paradoxes which put side by side opposites and actually showed you how different these things actually were. And so Luther begins to identify uh, the difference between uh, 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 grace and uh, works. He identifies the difference, of course, uh, finally between glory and the cross. And in this particular difference now, Luther is going to lay out this, uh, th this matter of holding the difference between what it means to be a theologian of glory and what it means to be a theologian of the cross. There were many students uh, or many uh, people in the audience uh, when Luther gave this to his fellow hermits uh, and among them, some of the most important people uh, in the subsequent Reformation, Bootser or Booker, as we say in America, and uh, also uh, uh, um, uh, 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 some of the uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, followers of Luther that were going to stick very close to him were here at the Heidelberg Disputation, but they all marveled at what happened when they heard Luther open up these theses and just read them out loud. They themselves started to speak uh, in excited tones and also frightened tones. And those who were there said that what was going on while, while Luther was reading these uh, theses was that all of the people were beginning to whisper and talk. Did he really say that? What does he mean by this particular thing? And uh, the, the uh, nerves got greater and greater in the room for what Luther was actually pr uh, presenting to them uh, until one fellow from the back uh, raised his hand and said, if the peasants found out what you were saying, they would stone you alive right here. And uh, everyone uh, uh, laughed, uh, tittered a little bit, it settled down, and then they realized that in the audience you were either going to get from Luther a recantation from the 95 Theses and obedience to his superiors, or you are now going to have standing in front of you a free man. And Luther stood before them as a free man, and they could already smell the pyre burning. They knew where this was going to head up, end up, and they knew that Luther himself, before the year was out, was going to be identified completely and utterly as a heretic, and there was only one way that this was going to end. Now, Booker uh, was not taking notes at the time, but he memorized three of the theses so that when he got out, he immediately wrote a letter to his friends identifying the three things that Luther said that absolutely floored him. The first one he noticed is number 13 of the, uh, uh, of the Heidelberg Disputation. And if you have it, and if you want, you can uh, pull it out of your uh, gift sack. Uh, and here, of course, we've got this wonderful translation from Caleb uh, and editing from Kelsey. Every time I think that the uh, Lutheran Church has gone off the end of the cliff, and that's it. Then suddenly uh, I find a few of these young people. We've got a new generation, uh, and here we've got Caleb and Kelsey ready to take over. Well, uh, uh, let's take a look at number 13, if you've got it. If you don't, I'm just going to read it out uh, for you. Uh, Booker says, uh, here's what I remember uh, from, uh, from Luther. Free will is in name only. There is the first thing here. 
Well, who says something like that? Uh, where, where is he going with this? Caleb is right when the, uh, in the uh, translation here. After the fall, free will exists only as a concept. Only as a concept. Uh, this is only as a title. Only as an empty uh, box holding something. An, an idea merely. And it is not really a thing. Now, in a very short period of time, Luther is going to be asked to recant from this particular matter. And he is going to be uh, asked to take this back because you cannot be in the church and say that you believe that the will is bound. And Luther is now not only going to recant this, but he is going to increase the heat. He said, I once said it was in name only. I should have said straight out, it's a fiction. It's what you call today fake news. There it is. Uh, you do not have this. Uh, and this little power that you think that is going to open up your future, this is not the thing that we have here. This is going to lead Luther in a very short period of time, by 1525, to write his great book, The Bondage of the Will. And uh, there is a wonderful uh, commentary on this. It's called The Outlaw God. Uh, well, it was written by me, so you have, you have to take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but it's better to go back and read the real thing. I know that. Uh, but the bondage of the will is coming right out of uh, Article 13. Then Booker says, I remember another one. Let's go uh, up to the front. It's number uh, three in the Heidelberg Disputation. I remember another one. This one shocked me. He says, it says, good works are probably sins. <laughs> I like it. I, once again, Caleb is exactly right the way it's translated. Even though the works of man always seem to be beautiful and good, they are nevertheless demonstrably deadly sins. They will actually kill you, not give you life. And of course, Booker says, I, th this guy is really something. Uh, uh, he is not going to take back the 95 Theses, and he is going to go all the way here. You do not have free will, and your good works themselves are deadly to you. But the one that really got him was number one, so go right to the uh, front. And Booker wrote this uh, in uh, a disbelief, and at the same time, he was excited by this. Uh, this one has to do with the law of God itself. And listen to its parts. The law of God which is the most beneficial doctrine of life, is not able to advance man toward righteousness, but rather stands against him. Now, Booker knew what this is saying, and uh, he wrote it out in this way. Uh, Luther told us that the law of God was the healthiest thing we had. It is the thing that actually is going to create a healthy environment and a healthy life. The old translation said this is the most salutary doctrine of life, the thing that is actually going to uphold life in this world. I want all of you to hear this right off the bat before I go any further, because I know that not only are some of you called uh, antinomians, but I'm supposed to be the poster child of an antinomian. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, the law is the best thing you've got going in life. It is the thing that actually will continue this life in the best possible way. And uh, Luther is uh, making a point of this, the law of God, which is the most beneficial doctrine of life, the great thing that God has given us. Nevertheless, now here is his paradox and contrast. Nevertheless, even though it is the greatest thing that you've got going in your life, it is not able to advance you toward righteousness. And everybody assumed that they were on the pathway to righteousness. They were on what you now call the stairway to heaven. Uh, and on the, way, uh, on the way, of course, they were looking for a motor or a way to be pushed in this direction, to go up the ladder, as Gerhard Ferdi used to always say. But Luther is now saying, the law will not advance you not one little bit further. Not only will it not advance you on your way, but it will actually inhibit you. It will stop you. Now, Caleb is right here uh, in the translation. Uh, this is not uh, simply that it will hinder you, though it will do that. It stands against you 
That is, it accuses you. It uh, holds out the finger, it points it at you, and it now says, you are the man. Uh, it is not advancing you on your way, but it is, in fact, hindering you. This uh, uh, obest verb actually comes from, or comes from the family uh, of, uh, of the uh, uh, noun obex, which is the word that was used by Roman theologians to say that the, uh, that the uh, uh, Eucharist is always effective. It will always work except on one condition and occasion, and that is if you present any obex to it if you present any hindrance to it. And now Luther is saying an unbelievable thing. The best thing you have from God for life in this world, the healthiest thing, is not uh, advancing you. More than that, it is hindering you. It is the obex. And it is the thing now that is going to accuse you. And those uh, who who are going to uh, attempt in some way or another to say that this is not in fact what the law always is and does are going to be greatly mistaken because Luther is identifying how it is here that you truly understand what the negative means and what the power of the negative means. This one eventually is going to lead uh, Luther to his antinomian disputations down the line, but here he is going to hold this particular matter. Both of these, the law is the best thing you've got, and it is also the thing that is accusing you and will not let you move on your way. Now, as uh, Luther is laying these things out and uh, the audience is shocked by hearing that they have no free will, that their, good will, that their good works are actually now killing them, and that the law, which is the best thing that they've got, is not helping them at all. In fact, it is standing in obstruction, standing against them. Luther now, ju- I want you to jump ahead to number 17, where Luther is going to give them a little bit of respite And this also is going to be the place in the Heidelberg Disputation where we start to develop problems and is the reason, I'm convinced of it, why Luther later on is not going to use the terminology, the theology of the cross. And it comes right here in this 17th article, that uh, that, uh, uh, thesis. That says, nor is speaking like this a reason to be hopeless, but causes one to be humbled and seek after the grace of Christ. Now, this is what Luther thought the negative meant. Luther thought the negative meant you are to be humbled. And how do you suppose his fellow hermits heard that? Well, finally they cheered. Uh, the, uh, The rest of it did not fit, but this one they knew because they were in the business of humility. And they were going to practice. They were the professionals at it. And when you are a professional at humility, you don't want this particular practice to go away. And Luther threw them a bone at this particular time. But I want you to watch what he's doing here. Here in the 17th uh, thesis, he is now creating a paradox that is talking about hopelessness. And he is taking up this second of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 13. These, uh, these three, faith, hope, and love abide. The greatest of these is, is love. Now Luther is taking up this second one on the matter of hope. And the question is, what can you hope for when the law itself has been taken away as your means or object of hope? What is there to hope in? But he doesn't yet answer that. He first says what you can't hope in, the negation, the negative. This, he says, you cannot hope in because uh, it will cause you to be humbled. It will cause you to seek the grace of Christ, but not yet find it. Uh, Turn the page on 18. Now Luther starts using uh, pronouns and we have to start figuring out he, how he's going to fill these in. Uh, thesis 18. It is certain that a man must give up all hope in his own ability before he is able to receive the grace of Christ. This is called a self-emptying, a self-negation. And you have to believe that his uh, fellow monks thought they understood precisely how this happens. 
In fact, I have to pause here to say that we've got a problem with the theology of the cross, which actually masquerades itself, and it actually starts to say that what it can love is the negative, the opposite of the rest of the world loves. And if you can figure out how to do this, love that which is unlovely, then you will finally achieve what it is that God is after uh, with you. This is not the theology of the cross. It is a negative theology of glory. And this is sprouting up all over the place. I like negativity too. I like everything upside down. I like the loser, not the winner. Uh, I like uh, those people who are down and lowly and not the high and mighty. I love all of this sort of thing. I love everything that you can flip around upside down and say this is what we should really be after. Instead of reading Spider-Man, you read Deadpool. Uh, this, is how, this is how you operate in life. And of course, I, uh, I'm speaking to the choir here. Uh, you all have to get a tattoo. I mean, uh, this is, uh, this, this is the, the life of negativity. And I used to enjoy this as well, especially when it was just old Navy men who had a Polynesian woman on the arm dancing around when they flexed their muscle. Those were the days of tattoos. <laughs> now, 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 now I have to read your personal mission statements. Uh, <laughs> on your arm. I, <laughs> I, well, I, like, I love negativity, but not quite that far. I can even learn how to love my ugly dog's breath. We, are, we, uh, we, we, we get uh, fascinated with this particular matter of the negative and how I can actually learn to love this. I have uh, now lived with students long enough who you probably uh, have no idea what they're talking about who say this is what we mean by queer. Queering things, the queer theory. And of course they believe that they have taken this directly out of Luther and the theology of the cross. And uh, nevertheless they are producing nothing other than a negative theology of glory that tells you that if you can love what everyone else hates, God will now love you. If you can now take up what is the underside of life, the underbelly of life, uh, and live the low life, then you will be something great and glorious. But this is nothing other than humility in the old monastic sense. And Luther now is not yet able to give this up. So he keeps telling us what it is that we're not to hope for. But he hasn't quite figured out in the Heidelberg Disputation what it is you're supposed to put your hope in. He is telling you how to empty yourself of all of your hopes, but not precisely what to put it in. And for that reason, he now says you have to rework your desires, not to uh, desire the beautiful and the good, but the ugly and that which loses in life. But all of this gets mixed up. It's over on Thesis 21, when Luther uh, now says, a theologian of glory says that evil is good and good is evil. A theologian of the cross says that a thing is what it actually is. Now, the great thing about these theses is that Luther starts using these pronouns, but he doesn't have a pronoun right there for you. So he says, the a theologian of the cross says that a thing is what it actually is. Here's the question. What is it? What is this it that Luther is after? so that we can understand what the is is. You know that uh, later on Luther is going to be very well aware of what the is is because Jesus just said it. This is my body. But this gave Luther endless trouble, especially from those who were supposedly following him as reformers, but they had merely become a negative theologians of glory because they did not understand what it is. Luther goes further. Uh, thesis 22, that particular wisdom which uses works to interpret the visible things of God entirely inflates, blinds, and hardens. He knows that your eyes and your feelings are not actually going to follow this properly. And so he says uh, the theologian of the cross is going to call an id what it is, race. 
and what is that id? What is that thing? Uh, Luther, uh, even at this point, uh, thought the same thing that Moses thought when he was uh, brought up on Mount Sinai. There Moses was given the eternal law, which looks like uh, it would be the it, the thing, the thing that is in fact going to pr uh, provide not only hope but glory. But uh, Luther later uh, enjoyed telling this story and retelling it. When Moses turned to God after receiving the law, he said, I wish I could see your glory. This is Exodus 33. This becomes the most important verse for the monks who were pursuing humility because they thought that they understood how it was that they could actually put their hope in the law and move their desires to its proper external object. But what's the next thing our Lord does with Moses? He says, Moses, you cannot see my glory and live. And therefore... Instead of letting you see my glory, I am going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to turn you around so that you are seeing nothing but the corner of the wall. That's the way I spent most of my, my youth. Uh, <laughs> looking at the corner of the wall and being told from my back that the law was a good thing. And I would be my friend if I only truly understood how it was operating. And there, uh, with his face in the cleft, something really amazing happened. Instead of getting a command as the it, the thing that one hopes in, there was a silence that followed, and then a word, I intend to preach to you. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And there, as Luther says later, Moses learns that it is, that is not the law that is the thing, but it is Christ who is the thing. And he becomes the first Christian. He is hearing what the gospel actually has to say. It is not going to be the works of the law. It is going to be mercy itself and alone. And it is not your free will that is going to do this. It is going to be God's will when, where, and how. That takes us to Thesis 26, where Luther is now zeroing in on this. The law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and all things are already done. Now, Luther says, here's our great contrast. It's between law and grace. He hasn't even refined the terms uh, yet, but he knows what grace is because throughout all of the Heidelberg Disputation, Luther is doing nothing new. He's doing nothing on his own. He told his brother Friars that all of this comes from one place, and if you want to go read it, go ahead and do it. It comes from Augustine's uh, little book, The Letter and the Spirit. And Luther is just going through this bit by bit, and, the, uh, the, the, and, and finding what it is that Augustine is saying there, and specifically what Paul means when Paul says, apart from the law. This is going to happen apart from the law. Because the law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and all things already, right now, here, not in one possible future, not, uh, not if you do this or that, but right now is already done. Now, once again, Luther has left us with a pronoun. Believe in this. Well, before he left us with hope in it, now we've got believe in this. Well, what does he mean, believe in this? How am I going to find this? Does he mean that I am now going to turn my life upside down and take the law, invert it, and say that everything society likes, I'm now going to tip it on its side, and I'm going to do exactly the opposite? That is not a theologian of the cross. That is a 17-year-old boy. That's all that is. <laughs> Uh, who has turned that upside down, a negative theologian of glory, and most of you have one in your house right now, who's operating at full force and thinks now that what freedom is, is to simply turn the law upside down and do exactly the opposite of what mom has said and what dad has said, and that is freedom. 
This is why it was Augustine who said, I stole the pears because it was evil. This is the pure matter of negativity. Is this what Luther is after? The law says do this and it is never done. Grace says believe this and it is already done. Now we have to go on a search. Fock hoc, do this, nothing comes. Crede in hunk, believe in this, what is the this? There are whole groups of people now who have tried to fill this in. Uh, either with a realist understanding that says you have an inner light that will connect immediately at the right time and right situation without a preacher and without an external word. This fascinated Luther for a period of time. And this, himself, this is where he himself is shedding this particular matter, which has come back, especially in Lutheran theologies, over and over in the present. But the one that it comes up most often at this point is what usually is called existentialism. And so, for some strange reason, uh, I keep being blamed for this particular matter. So I'm now not, uh, I, I am not, not I, I'm now not recanting. I am giving my resolution. This is what existentialism is and does. It says all that faith is is a leap in the dark. That's what it is. Many of you have actually learned this, uh, and uh, you, you have uh, understood and even teach people, you must simply leap. You do not know what uh, lies out there. You do not know what, in fact, God thinks of you. And uh, as uh, one of the great existentialists, uh, not only Kierkegaard, but Boltmann said at this point, what Luther is telling us is that faith is not knowing, but believing nevertheless and therefore believing in exactly nothing. That is this age. It is existentialist and it believes in exactly nothing because everything else that it has tried has failed because do this is said and it is never done. And they have enough uh, in the tank to know uh, that whatever is being told them out there in the world is not working. This is not what Luther is going to end up with. But he's hanging at this time. He's hanging by a rope. He's trying to figure out what this matter of faith is uh, and what it means to believe in this. So in the very next uh, 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 thesis, uh, Luther tries to fill this in. Actually, one should call the work of Christ. There it is. What should I believe in? Believe in the work of Christ. Amen. Believe in the work of Christ. But now Luther is going to try to figure out what that is. Uh, the work, what is the work of Christ? He says it is an actually functioning work and our work is a completed work. Luther still has this idea that there is a cooperation between your work and God's even though he himself recognizes here that from Augustine when you say the work is completed now it means that Christ is doing the thing and the thing that he's doing is actually making faith in you. So far, so good. So now we've got faith is in something. We also know that it is to be in Christ and it is to be in his work. But Luther hasn't quite figured out yet what it means for us to actually get faith and more specifically what faith itself is in. If you turn to the last thesis, Luther is going to get as close as he does in the Heidelberg Disputation to answering what are we to believe in? Uh, how do we, uh, in fact, understand the work of Christ? Then he gives us the next uh, phrase. He says, the love of God. That's what I mean by the work of Christ. That's what you are to believe in. Now, all of this sounds very fine. Uh, it sounds very good. But if Luther ended here, we would have a theology of the cross, and we would all be Calvinists, pure and simple. This is where this all goes from this point on. If Luther did not discover the next thing in 1518 by the end of that year. Because what normally happens at this point is that the preacher says, God is love. Now believe that. Uh, what's the problem with this? This is a true statement. 
This is in fact, this can be put in the same way regarding the work of Christ. You can say Christ took the entire sin of the world upon himself in the cross. You can say that. And when you leave any of these particular statements as the thing in which you are to believe, you are now giving the person to believe a word that is general, it is abstract, it is true, but it does not actually tell you whether you believe and what you believe in. And so what do you have to do? You say, I hear that the love of God uh, is what I must believe in. I don't feel the love of God right now. I don't see the love of God in front of me. Earlier on, Luther says, you don't, the old theologians tried to look through the things of the world to the invisible that lay behind, uh, but that is not actually what God is doing. He says, take a look at the thing that's actually there. And what do you actually see when you open your, uh, your eyes and see what the work of Christ is? You see Christ hanging on the tree dead. And then you say, now, can I believe that? Better yet, Luther is now going to use the monastic terminology. Can I desire that? Can I actually see Christ hanging on the cross and say, yes, that's what I want. That is my greatest desire, my greatest hope, the thing that I want more than anything else. By the time this year is done, Luther now is going to note, you cannot love the cross. You can sing all kinds of uh, hymns about how you're going to come to the cross. Uh, you can wear jewelry of the cross. You can do all of these things regarding the cross. But as Luther is going to observe, you can't love the cross. More than that, you are offended by Christ. Why are you offended by Christ? And why did he end up on the cross after all? Because he came and told you something that you did not want to hear. Your good works are killing you. The, the good works themselves are the evil, not the good that you thought was, was the case. And then you step back and you say, now what am I supposed to believe in? Am I supposed to believe in an objective theory of atonement uh, so that I, I, I identify and assent to it? And once I give my assent to it, now it in fact comes true for me. This is the old uh, problem now that the Reformed always have of trying to take a general statement of truth. God is love. Christ has taken the sins of the world upon himself and self-apply it. This has uh, a, a particular uh, a name. Uh, this this uh, particular matter is, uh, is, uh, is uh, what is meant as a practical syllogism. And this is what makes up the great Reformed tradition but it's also what kills them. The practical syllogism says, God is love. God loves everyone. I am everyone, or at least one of everyone. Therefore, God must love me. And here is a little rule that you have to speak in your head. I have to apply this to myself. I have to tell myself over and over again that I assent to it. I have to agree with the general principle. And if I don't agree with the general principle, then, of course, I don't have faith. And the very next thing is that you have to look down at your own belly button and try to identify some truth within yourself as to whether or not you really are believing this uh, or really are not believing this. And this is where Luther himself lays hanging at the end of the Heidelberg Disputation and this problem of can I love the most negative thing in the world, the crucified Jesus Christ hanging in front of me? Can I actually find the way to do this? And by, uh, by, by the end of the year, his answer was simply no. And he is going to finally release you from this last particular matter of how it is that you try to become a theologian of the cross rather than a theologian of glory, but end up only being a negative theologian uh, of glory uh, and do not find the cross itself. The cross cannot be loved. 
Now, when Luther is uh, working on his resolutions and refusing to recant the 95 theses, there are two theses in particular that, uh, that Cajetan begins to focus on and get ready for the trial of Luther. They're number 58, the 95 theses, and number 7. Number 58 it speaks about the merits of Christ. And Luther now in his resolution says the merits of Christ are not the Pope's treasury of merit. They are not the Pope's slush fund. <laughs> and uh, nevertheless, he now says not only uh, are they not the Pope's slush fund, but they must be something positive. And for the first time, Luther goes to Matthew 16, 9 and says, what must these merits of Christ be? The office of the keys. And there it appears. And Luther says, instead of the Pope with the merits of Christ, we now have the office of the keys. Then in number seven, he says, God humbles you. There's the issue. You do not humble yourself. God is going to humble you. But how does he humble you? By trying to force you down, to remove all of the good things in life so that you don't prosper, you are, you are not successful, and so on? I have lived with false uh, theologians of the cross all my life, and that's why they make no money. Uh, that's why I can't get any money out of them. I always tell them that my favorite verse of Scripture is, give gifts to your teacher, and I get nothing. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is not what uh, humility means. God humbles you. And when God humbles you now, uh, he, uh, uh, Luther continues in his resolutions number seven. This is the way he humbles you. He makes you submit to the local priest. How do you like that? He makes you submit to the local priest. And there Luther discovers what this means. It does not mean you bow down and kiss the ring of the priest. You submit to the local priest who has the office of the keys, the merits of Christ, and no greater authority is found anywhere in Christendom, not even in the papacy. And that means that when the priest says, I absolve you, you are absolved. And now Luther has found his Believe this. This is a gift and a promise. It is not a sheer negation or a leap into the dark. Now he goes down to Cajetan in Augsburg, and Cajetan picks up these two theses and says, Luther, you cannot possibly mean, first, that this does not belong, the merits do not belong to the Pope, but they belong now to anyone with the office of the keys. And secondly, that you are humbled before the priest by listening to the priest give you an absolution. That would mean that people coming to you for an absolution and leaving you after the absolution are absolutely certain and have no doubt at all. And Luther said, yes. That's exactly what that means. And Cajetan says, well, then you have created a new church. And Luther later says, this is when I was the one person left in the Christian church. So if you think things are skinny now, they were real thin uh, at that particular time. And Luther says, yes, this is exactly right. What this means is that you have no spiritual journey. You are not supernatural. You are not moving up to the glory. You do not say, I'm finding a way to love that which is abhorrent. You are not turning the law upside down. You are not saying in any way, shape, or form uh, that the law does not accuse, uh, that the law does not obstruct me. You do not say that I believe that I can love the cross of Jesus Christ. Believe in what? Well, believe in this. I forgive you for all of your good deeds. There, you believe that. Christ has now uh, uh, become the big mouth, and you can go with absolute certainty. This is a new church. You'll, you, you will be free here. You are free. All right, well, you go. Mm -hmm.